2018. Thank you, honorable delegates, uh, dignitaries, and panelists for the attention. I welcome you to the second plenary session of the Partners Forum 2018. I hope you all had a lovely lunch and a power pack to enjoy our second plenary session of the day. It is my honor and pleasure to introduce the moderator for plenary two session, Ms. Asha George. She's a South African research chair in health systems, complexity, and social change at the School of Public Health, University of the Western Cape, South Africa. Chair of Health Systems Global, Georgia, and adjunct professor at the School of Public Health, John Hopkins University, USA. Ms. Asha George is an advisor to UNICEF, WHO, and USAID on community-based approaches. While based in India, she partnered with allies across community, district, state, and national health systems to advance maternal health from a gender and rights perspective. Please join me with a huge round of applause in welcoming Ms. Asha George. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very well warm welcome. Honorable dignitaries, distinguished guests, and participants, I'm so excited that we have such a broad range of stakeholders here. We have government leaders, civil society representatives, activists, young people, media, implementers, researchers, and donors. And that's one part of the partnerships that we're trying to forge here across different levels of our society but we're going to be talking about how they come together to support action across multiple sectors as well. So in 1920, um, in 2014, um, WHO was very influential and I'm pleased that Dr. Shama Kurvila is here, but there was a leading study that was published at the last PMNCH forum that was the launch of the landmark success factor studies and it found that even with similar resources, some countries did better than others. And that success in improving maternal and child health outcomes in that era was due to countries facilitating collaboration across sectors. And since that time, there's been a huge flurry of work led by WHO, and we are really privileged to launch the special supplement in the British Medical Journey uh, Journal that um, documents the many successful examples of multi-sectoral action. Multi-sectoral action, you know, has been part of the Alma Ata agenda and was again referenced in Astana. But what we're talking about here is not the rhetoric, the words that have always been listed as an aspirational sort of wish that we should have multi-sectoral collaboration. But our esteemed panel will be looking, talking about, and sharing their experiences of concrete examples of action. How do we move from rhetoric to reality? Our panelists will look at what types of collaboration are most effective, what are the key elements of that collaboration that leads to, to the most effective transformative change. We will have, the panel has multiple, just like multi-sectoral action has multiple sectors, the panel has multiple moving parts. So we will have first, um, we are really honored to, um, we'll introduce, I'll introduce um, Dr. Shama Kurvila and Dr. Wendy Graham, who will launch the BMG series. And you should have that supplement in your bags. So if you haven't had a chance to look at it yet, I would encourage you to look in your bags for a copy of that phenomenal supplement. And they'll tell us all the hard work that's, that lies behind that supplement. We'll then have a chance to hear from the ministers behind some of the case studies in the supplement. And there'll be specific questions and they'll share from their point of view key aspects of what they thought was fundamental to the success of those case studies. 
And then we'll close with a more open-ended dialogue on key questions looking at the life cycle of multi-sectoral co collaboration. What triggers change? What types of leadership brings sectors together? And what makes for sustainable change over the long term? Altogether, I think these are some of the fundamental learnings of how do we move, and I was really pleased, the, the first plenary in the morning already began to flag multi-sectoral action. There were key references to multi-sectoral action in ECD for affirming sexual and reproductive health and rights in advancing gender equity. So I thought that was a great setting for this plenary and a great entry point. And I think it'll, these themes will reverberate throughout the session. So before I hand over, let me just formally introduce, some of you will need no introduction, but let me do my duty as a moderator. And to do justice, because some of the esteemed speakers we have have made so many contributions. So let me just take some time to formally introduce the first two panelists because they're going to launch this supplement, and then I will um, introduce the remaining panelists. So Dr. Shama Kurvila is Senior Strategic Advisor to the Family, Women, Children, Adolescents, and Life Course Cluster at the World Health Organization. Her areas of expertise include health and sustainable development strategies and program management, policy science, and very importantly, political philosophy. She is co-chair of the Global Steering Committee for the Multisectoral Collaboration Study, with cross-country findings being launched here today at the Partners Forum. She is joined by Dr. Wendy Graham, who was one of the first to set up the research group on maternal health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in the UK. She did that before moving to the University of Aberdeen's Medical School and Aberdeen Maternity Hospital, where she remains an emeritus professor. She's since returned to the London School of Tropical Medicine and holds a position there as professor of obstetric epidemiology. And she's also been on this journey with Shama and has been a co-chair of the Global Steering Committee for the Multisectoral Collaboration Study. They'll pro provide an overview of that exciting supplement and then introduce a film that also captures some of the key findings. So please give them a big, warm round of applause. looking for the slide operator to move the slides on. Thank you, Rachel. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, so this is a celebration, and we wanted to dance, but that didn't seem appropriate. So here we are, <laughs> acknowledging the rally. Yes. And this is a big <laughs> celebration about an important piece of work. Thank you, Wendy. And we just thought that the SDGs are such a humongous task that it's good to take stock once in a way and celebrate. So what we're doing here is we're acknowledging some new knowledge that is about the power of multi-sectoral collaboration in advancing the SDGs. And we're doing this at a time when we're also launching this BMJ supplement. But let's go back to the beginning and, and share with the audience how this all started, Shilma. At the last Partners Forum in uh, 2014, we all discussed how the countries that were progressing well in the MDGs we're progressing not only in health, but in other sectors as well, as you can see in that graph. And so we realize that multisectoral collaboration is really important at the heart of the SDGs and at the heart of the Every Woman, Every Child Global Strategy. So what we wanted to do was to talk about here the 12 country case studies that have been developed after, over the last 12 months, and as I said, this BMJ supplement. But importantly, as Asha has mentioned, this is not about whether we need multi-sectoral collaboration or not. It's more about how to do it and how to do it effectively and how to have success in multi-sectoral collaboration. So 12 is quite a big number um, for any of us to retain. Um, so I think we need to say a little bit to summarize what the case studies were about. So what's amazing is that all of these are real world examples 
of partners and countries working at scale, working sustainably, and also importantly, effectively, efficiently, and equitably. And um, as Asha mentioned, you all have the details in your bags. And it's important to also recognize that there was diversity. If you think about these, I moved on, yes. If you look, these are the other six. We saw the first six. These are short abbreviated titles of the, of the papers. And these are the second six. And I think you can get a sense of the breadth across the 12. The 12 cover diversity of countries. We have low, middle, and high income countries. We have some of the, some of the case studies focus on some SDGs, and some are focusing on different elements of the themes in the every woman, every child. And what was important is even though these contexts were so different, that there were principles or lessons that were applicable across all of them. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah. So it is amazing what's happened. The because, one before that. Oh, yes, I think you've jumped. <laughs> this is the problem without having a mouse up here. We're mouse Oh, no, no, so the next, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the important thing is to notice that these were put together in 12 months, which is why we want to celebrate and to congratulate all of those many people who actually took part in this, because it was a huge undertaking. It was 12 months, 12 country case studies, two opinion pieces, one major synthesis article, an editorial, and this learning that was achieved through this series will carry on here in the forum and beyond. Next slide, please, Rachel. So PMNCH had put out a call for proposals, and over 300 proposals were received, and many of you in this room were served on the expert review committees and 12 country case studies were selected, and we are very honored to have the ministers of some of those case studies present these amazing stories and successes. We were also really fortunate to have such amazing country teams and collaborations, and also to have uh, uh, an excellent global steering committee. Again, many of you in this room, and thanks to all of you. So as, as this slide shows, we're, we're slightly out of sync, but Rachel is trying very hard over there. It's not easy to spot you in between the, the cables, <laughs> but <laughs> thank you, Rachel. So um, as Chama says, there were a large number of applications. We had over 300 people applying to do the case studies, and out of those, we selected 12 with a very systematic process. But for those 12, we had over 500 individuals involved. So you can see that although 12 might not sound huge, actually behind those 12 are 500 partners, and the picture shows smiling faces despite the very hard work that was put in. But of course, there were challenges along the way. It wasn't always smooth running. And just to give you some examples, during the course of the case study, there was a, a, a traumatic volcano in Guatemala. <laughs> There were elections, sometimes yes. snap elections in Sierra Leone, Malaysia, and Cambodia. But what was amazing is the commitment of all the country teams to really produce these stories and results and learning uh, so that we could uh, discuss these on time. And the important thing is that people pull together. And I love this pyramid of people because in some ways it, it shows a number of different things. It shows the importance of coordination and balance. If you're doing multi-sectoral collaboration, it's very important that there is effective collaboration going on. But also the other thing about multi-sectoral collaboration is it's a disruptive process. To achieve transformation, it must disrupt. And you must welcome that disruption, disruptive process. But through the case studies, what we also find, and it certainly wasn't pressing a button, but certainly across the 12 country case studies, there are real examples of best practice in coordination, in communication, and in collaboration. And in the BMJ supplement, Tobias Alfen and colleagues um, talk about the need to be smarter and work more strategically across sectors, not necessarily setting up new platforms and so on. And I think the other side of it, which alludes to something you can read about in the supplement, which is about the idea of a learning society. When you're working in a multi-sectoral collaboration, it's very much about learning by doing, but learning also from those situations that don't go so well, things that might be regarded as failures. So learning from success and learning from lesser success or failure is a really important mantra of a, of a learning society. And it's rather like getting on this bike. I mean, some of you will learn, remember this from the days of learning to ride. You get on the bike, you fall off it, you get back on again, you keep trying. And I think some of those, the important thing that in that process of learning to ride a bike, 
you are also realising that some of the failures also taught you lessons. And that's really important. And during our discussions, we talked about this idea of heroic failures. And it was fascinating that some companies now have actually institutionalized this. For example, Tata has this Dare to Try Award, which is about innovative projects that have been implemented in a rigorous way, but didn't achieve the results that they needed. And this is celebrated, documented, and learned from as paving the path to success. But we're in India, and it's good to show some beautiful pictures. And some of you may recognize that this is a neural network. And we put this up really to talk about the learning society, which is discussed quite a lot in particularly the editorial. A learning society is a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing because if you go back to the real origins of the word of a learning society, it's about continuous learning, active citizenship, and social well-being. And those elements of a learning society we used as principles to write the synthesis paper, which you can also read about in the BMJ series. Good, so now that we've introduced the supplement, where, where, where do we go next, Wendy? And maybe yes. an, one of the auto rickshaws, or? One of our auto rickshaws, yes. I, I remember that, one, that trip very well, actually, Sharma, <laughs> um, with our face masks. Um, so the important thing is if you believe in the learning society, then it's really important that learning is a continuous process. So we hope that this process that has started and been launched here continues not beyond the forum and into countries so there can be South-South exchange about the lessons learned. And these lessons really are important to reach the global strategy objective, so to ensure that all people can survive and have well-being, have access to quality services, not only in the health sector, with universal health coverage, as Prime Minister Modi so, uh, was so committed to, but also beyond and services across the SDGs. And of course, Thrive is important as well. Modi said we must keep an eye on what the ultimate goal is of the collaboration that we undertake. Thrive is important because it's part of the SDG agenda and the issue of for all people of all ages to have access to uh, health, but also access their, realize their full potential and their rights, as I said, irrespective of age. So we've heard a lot about youth. I hope it includes the less youthful as well. Yes. And then to transform, that to transform societies, every woman, child, and adolescent must have the power to shape their future and contribute to sustainable development. Okay, so as a celebration of we're saying shouldn't really end, and there have already been calls to action. So I suppose as the co-chairs of this series, this series of studies that have been carried out, and the BMJ, we feel that there are some particular things we would like to flag, and there are three of them. Firstly, to view multi-sectoral collaboration as an opportunity and not a threat. However, it needs to be a managed process, it needs investment, and it needs smart working. So it isn't business as usual, it does require disruption and smart working and investment. Secondly, we think this learning approach where there is an opportunity to learn from lesser success, not to bury the lesser success, but to share it in a safe way so that others can learn from that as well. That means we need to change things about attitudes towards lesser success amongst implementers, donors, international agencies, and indeed academics as well, and journals. So it would be wonderful to see perhaps a section of the BMJ in the future, I know we have our BMJ partners here, a section on heroic failures. The boldness to come forward and to say that something we tried honestly, it didn't work as well as we want, and we want to share that lesson. That's a heroic failure, and it should be shared, not buried. And of course, the important thing is that when you come together across multiple sectors, your definition of success is not, is not consistent. We have to recognize that success can be measured on a lots of different bases and according to lots of different parameters. And when you work multi-sectoral, you need to respect each other's perspective on what you're defining as success. So these are the three calls that we would make. Thanks, Wendy. And um, as we said before, there were some common clues for success or signposts for success across these yeah. country case studies. And you'll shortly see a short two-minute video that highlights some of these, um, the, these findings. 
And for one, one thing, for example, as Wendy talked about the success, it was also about defining the problem, that it wasn't defined only in a biomedical way, but also in a way that all sectors could see its relevance and that it contributed to the public good. Okay, so Shoma and I will continue our celebrations off stage now, and you will watch the video, but thank you very much for listening, and I hope we kept to our six minutes, 40 seconds, which was what our allotted time was. Thank you very much. Thank you. We are undertaking a quest to respond to a challenge for our society. We all have different skills and different ideas for how to tackle this challenge. Our best approach is to chart the way forward together in a way that is meaningful for us all to achieve our shared goal. Let's build on what is available, be innovative and draw on each other's strengths. Here's just one example. In Sierra Leone, in response to the Ebola crisis, a school-based program was redesigned as a radio education program in partnership with children and communities and expanded to include new multisectoral partners and experts. To achieve our goals, we had to learn by doing, openly communicate and check our progress along the way. We had to be open to change and make sure we had a solution that worked in this context. We also had to adapt when things went wrong. In USA, for instance, feedback from stakeholders helped identify the strengths of the collaboration to promote healthy weight for children and adolescents, as well as what could be improved. It is important to invest in regular communication to strengthen relationships based on trust and transparency, and to build on diverse evidence and innovation. Our quest to improve health and sustainable development has led to policy wins, new ways of working, and new resources. Many countries are already making great strides in making multi-sectoral collaboration work. Let's learn and work together to make a difference for our societies. You know, I'm amazed it really is a celebration and that they were both standing there and being so cheerful because in one year to uh, look at all that collaboration, in one year to, to reach out to so many people around the world, work with country teams and to deliver something in a publication that's peer reviewed, that means peer reviewed by people you don't know who might not agree with, you know, it really was a very rigorous process and they survived to tell the tale, but there are also, I think, case studies from very different geographic contexts. You saw examples from the US, from Germany, as well as Sierra Leone, Latin America, and I think that's very exciting because there's something we can learn from each context and across the continuum of care, as well as survive, thrive, and transform. And we're very lucky now to hear from some of the ministers involved from those uh, case studies. I'll introduce the whole panel, but I think they're very keen to share from their perspective what were key elements of those case studies that they found particularly exciting and important to share for us to continue this journey of learning. So let me formally introduce, we're very lucky and we appreciate they've stepped away from the ministerial conclave um, and we really appreciate their time with us this afternoon. So we start with His Excellency Sri Jagat Prakash Nada. He welcomed us this morning at the start of the Partners Forum. He's the Union Minister of Health and Family Welfare from the Government of India. Parliamentary Board Secretary, of the Bharatiya Janata Party and Member of Parliament of Rajya Sabha from Himachal Pradesh. 
He has served three terms as member of the Himachal Pradesh State Legislative Assembly and held several state cabinet positions in the government of Himachal Pradesh. After being elected to the Rajya Sabha in April 2012, he served as a member of several parliamentary committees before being appointed as the Union Minister of Health and Family Welfare in November 2014. And as Union Minister, he has effectively launched multiple programs and initiatives on healthcare. And he's going to speak um, amongst those initiatives on the panel, he will reflect on Mission Indra Danush, but there are many initiatives that he's led. Let me go through and introduce each um, speaker, and then we'll have a round of applause to welcome everyone since we're running behind time. Um, we're also very pleased to welcome His Excellency Hassan Hashemi. He's the Minister of Health and Medical Education in the Islamic Republic of Iran since 2013, and is the first Minister of Health in two consecutive terms during the last five decades in Iran. He benefits from the full support of President Rouhani. He developed a nationwide health transformation plan to increase population coverage, promote high quality care, and reduce financial hardship in terms of reaching universal health coverage. He's also a professor of ophthalmology and the first applier of several advanced surgical procedures in ophthalmology and holds the highest rank uh, of ophthalmology surgeries in the country and indeed in the region. I then move, I'd like to introduce His Excellency Pok Bunak. He's from the, he's the Secretary of State of Ministry of Planning in Cambodia. So it's appropriate given that we're the panel on multi-sectoral action to have people who can speak from other sectors. His activities and responsibilities include population and development po policies, including the national population policy of, from 2016 to 2030, the national population aging policy, and various other po policy-related papers linking about the demographic div dividend, community development, and many other public policy issues. He's going to speak about the identification of poor households, ID poor, that program, but he's also been involved in the nutrition program, social protection, and he's also the planning focal point to the Cambodian permanent mission to the, to the UN, and sits on various interministerial committees. So obviously we'll bring lots of experience of how to collaborate across different sectors. We also have Ms. Fanny Kachale, who's the Director of Reproductive Health Services of the Ministry of Health and Population of Malawi, who serves as technical advisor to the Organization of African First Ladies Against HIV and AIDS, the Malawi chapter. She's committed to improving sexual and reproductive health and rights of adolescents, women, and men, and underserved populations. And she's been one of the key champions of the Chipatala Chapafoni, the Health Center by Phone initiative that's being featured in this supplement. I then would like to introduce Dr. Princess Notemba Simalela. She's our Assistant Director General for Family, Women, Children and Adolescents in the Life Course at the World Health Organization. She was previously Special Advisor to the Vice President of the Republic of South Africa and worked on social policy, which included multi-sectoral, government-wide response for HIV. Other senior leadership roles include serving as Chief Executive Officer of the South African National AIDS Council and Director of Technical Knowledge and support for IPPF, and she's published widely on women's health and been a key contributor to key guidelines on mother-to-child transmission to HIV. We then move to Dr. Purnima Menon. She's a senior research fellow at the International Food po Policy Research Institute, IFPRI. She's the theme leader for South Asian nutrition programs and IFPRI's Poverty Health Nutrition Division. And in India, she directs Poshan, 
partnerships and opportunities to strengthen and harmonize actions for nutrition in India. As part of generating evidence on nutrition, she undertakes empirical analysis of large-scale data, program evaluations, and policy analysis in India, but also across various countries in the region. She serves on national and global advisory and technical groups, including the Global Nutrition Report and Countdown to 2030. I then have Dr. Maureen Sams Vaughan, who came with us all the way from Jamaica. We're very lucky she arrived this morning. Uh, she's a professor of child health and child development and behavior at the University of the West Indies and is the first chair of Jamaica's Early Childhood Commission. She led the transformation of Jamaica's early childhood sector through the development and implementation of the first cross-sectoral national strategic plan for ECD in Jamaica. She's an advocate for vulnerable children, particularly children with disabilities and those impacted by violence, and has published multiple research papers that has impacted on policy in Jamaica. And lastly, but certainly not least, we have Dr. David Imbago Hakome. He's a primary care physician in a rural village in the Ecuadorian Amazonia. He served as board member of the Youth Coalition for Sexual and Reproductive Rights, an alternate board member of the Adolescent and Youth Constituency of PMNCH, and a focal point on Women Delivers Youth Engagement Group. David was part of the International Federation of Medical Students Associations for more than six years, where he served as General Assistant for the Americas and President of the National Association of Medical Students in Ecuador. He's actively involved in the field of reproductive rights through activism for safe abortion. So there we have our panel. We cut across HIV, health, planning commissions, ECD, nutrition, from the very top of their health system to physicians working at the primary care level. Everyone, please give them a very warm welcome. I'd like, I'm going to move down here. So the case studies, is this my first? Okay. So the case studies, we're very lucky to have an opportunity to learn more about the case studies from the perspectives of ministers who have championed them. And I'd like to flag also, there'll be a further opportunity to answer questions in the concurrent sessions that follow, which give another opportunity to delve in in depth to each of the case studies. So starting with India first, India's had a lot of success working across sectors for health and sustainable development, and the intensified mission Indra Dhanush strategy is an unprecedented collaboration between India's Ministry of Health and Family Welfare and 11 other ministries. 11, and numerous health and non-health stakeholders were involved to reach 90% full immunization coverage of children and preg pregnant women by 2020. I wonder if the minister could please share with us how did you ensure that links in a country as huge, large as India, as a federal country, how did you ensure the links between national level through states right down to the district for collaborations to move forward and ensure those links across sectors. What were the key mechanisms that you think were um, absolutely vital for ensuring success? Minister Nada? First of all, uh, we had a very successful program implementation in elimination of pulse polio. And uh, learning from the experiences of pulse polio we redesigned ourselves to see to it that immunization, which was at one point of time only 62%, had to be increased and brought to 90%. So learning from the polio elimination program, what we did was, first of all, we developed a, a national steering committee and interministerial committee. This interministerial committee, as you yourself said, that had 11 line ministries which were brought into the fold. And the same way, what we did was to develop a state task force, 
a district task force. We tried to find out where the left outs are. And in that, first of all, we divided in two processes. Number one process was that we came out with 190 districts where the immunization was not up to the mark. And the number of left outs was much more than the average which we wanted to see. So we detected them. The another thing which we did was, Honorable Prime Minister decided that we will find, we will uh, point out 140, we came out with 147 districts where the, uh, what we call the, uh, that uh, the, uh, the uh, outcomes and the statistics showed that they are one of the lowest 147 districts of the country. So we took the special emphasis for those 147 districts also. Now, in this strategy, first of all, we started with Mission Indra Dhanush, where uh, the state task force with interministerial committee communicated all this to the state, uh, to the national communicated this to the state committee, and they were given specific tasks, which was to be fulfilled in a particular timeline. And after that, we also decided that this should be translated to the district task committee and they have to follow how they will go forward. We came out in phases. In first phase, we had a week program of immunization. Then it was for four months. From a particular date, one week we did in the first month. Then in the second month also, one week we did the third month and the fourth month and this was called as the first phase. We had two phases that way and later on we had four phases. We came out with the observation that all after doing all this, we were able to address most of the districts and there were some uh, 50 to 60 districts left out, which needed more attention. So along with those 190, we took a special drive which is called as intensified mission in Dhanush and we again went, found out the left outs worked in detail and saw to it that how do we address these, these uh, districts and address the children and immunize them. This is how we have worked for immunization. Another thing what we did was in 147 districts, we selected some 13,000 villages which were to be immunized totally. And these were those villages again in the aspirational districts, which had low strategic uh, results, we decided in first phase 13,000 to 14,000 districts, and we immunized them completely. Then again, we took a second stage, where we took 40,000 villages, and we immunized them totally. So this is how we have gone forward. And now we can say that the immunization has increased from about eight, there was an increase of 18.5 percent points. That was the increase which has taken place. And now we are somewhere from 62 to 85 percent that we have gone forward as far as the immunization is concerned. But as you are talking about the linkages system, we have got a very robust system in all programs. Like if we talk about national health mission, the national health mission has got a common review mission where all all multi-sectors commonly visit the site, the states, they review along with the development partners and see what the statistics say and what the reality is. Where are the gaps and how we can fulfill the gaps. So this is what we keep on doing it with the common review mission. The same way we have got a national program implementation plan where all the state secretaries join together yearly they give their plans, we discuss with them, and we see to it that how this plan is to be implemented, and we, we, we approve those plans, along with we also review the plans what we had given the sanctions earlier. So there are, these are the methodologies which we have developed to see to it that there is a linkage between the state and the center, that is the national government. Uh, for communicable disease, there's a, com there's a continuous process which we have developed. Like for communicable diseases, uh, there's a regular, at frequent intervals, there's a video conference 
between the central minister and the state minister. There's a video conferencing between the state se national secretary and the state secretaries. There's a co continuous video conferencing between the DGHS, Director General of Health Services, and the state's uh, health uh, directors. And we also see to it that whether whatever has been communicated that has been implemented or not. The same way we also go for uh, media campaign. And through media campaign also we try to see to it that if there is any uh, rumors which has come up, because in health sector, you know, a lot of uh, reports keep coming which creates confusion, rumors are there. So through this media campaign, we are able to bust these bits which surround around, especially for immunization, and that is how we, we go forward. And uh, from time to time, the national task force, the district, uh, the state task force, and the district task force keep communicating with each other. And this is how we have kept the linkage. And there's a feedback system also. From time to time, we get the feedbacks also. We try to fill the gaps from the feedbacks which we get. Thank you so much, Minister Nada. So in a sense, you're talking very much referring to the active learning approach that uh, was listed in the, in the uh, opening presentation as a key learning, using data to identify which are the areas that reinforced action needs to be delivered, very close communication across levels of the health system, and working with media to reach out to community level to ensure there's coordinated action. That's very exciting to hear, and I hope there'll be an opportunity to reflect further on that. I know the minister from Iran has a pressing commitment, so I'm wondering if we can um, quickly move to him and ask for, for any reflections he has on key, what do you see are the strengths of how we bring different sectors together? And the example that Minister Nada um, talked about is where health leads. It's the lead sector that's driving, bringing other sectors together to work on immunization. In your view, what do you think are the forms of leadership that support multi-sectoral action? And are there experiences from Iran that you'd like to share reflecting on that? Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Let me share that the Supreme Council for Health and Food Safety chaired by His Excellency President, is responsible for ratifying executive intersectoral health-related policies at the nation level. This multi-sectoral high-rank entity provides ground for integrative approaches to public health, food, and policies with direct and indirect implication on public health. According to law, the Secretariat of the Council is based in the Ministry of Health and Medical Education and is mirrored in all 31 provinces to decentralize decision-making and ensure health in all policies at the local level. As a result, I have managed to deal with 12 ministries and state organizations. Accordingly, we have achieved to reduce pesticide consumption to replace tobacco cultivation with other products and to reformulate food products with less salt and sugar. Let me share with you few relevant challenges to multi-sectoral approach for health. Number one, sustained multi-sectoral cooperation and coordinated the response to health priorities. Number two, harmonization between UN agencies and stakeholders. And number three, community awareness, active and effective engagement to ensure bottom-up approach. And number five, active engagement of NGOs, and number five, uncertainty, sanction, and regional and global conflicts 
will endanger all plants. Ladies and gentlemen, in response to the above mentioned challenges, I established Deputy for Social Affairs in my ministry to deal with the, with the social determinant of health, intersectoral collaboration, and structured engagement of various community groups. We have organized more than 1,600 health-related NGOs and charities during the last three years. And we convinced at least six ministries to establish an independent health department in their headquarter with provincial reflections. We should ensure provision of incentives to the joint planning, implementation, monitoring, and resource mobilization interventions of different health and social development proposal by the governments and partners. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister Hashemi. It's very exciting to hear that you're tackling food safety and pesticide consumption. Those are very critical issues that are at the forefront. It's really challenging issues because it's not just coordination across sectors, but also dealing with corporate, the corporate sector and agriculture, much beyond the normal sectors that we collaborate with in health. And it's also very exciting to hear about the Department of Social Affairs that really tackles the social determinants of health, which is really how we need to address, is multi-sectoral collaboration addresses that. So I know that both ministers have pressing commitments um, in the um, ministerial conclave, so we really thank them for their contribution, and then we'll continue with the panel. So if others, um, if we could give them a warm round of applause and please excuse them. And we'll continue by staying in Asia and, and have an opportunity to discuss with the Minister from the Ministry of Planning from Cambodia. Uh, the Secretary of State, Pok Bunak, it's the first two examples were really focused on how health leads, how the ministries of health um, take forward multi-sectoral action or works across multiple levels. Here we have an example um, of the ID Poor program. It's Cambodia's national poverty identification system, which supports access of the most vulnerable people to social assistance interventions in health as well as other sectors. It provides an interesting example how the Ministry of Planning plays a key coordinating role across sectors. Um, I wonder if the Minister could share with us, how did you ensure standardization of the ID Poor program across all the different sectors, since it's a program that is not led by any one sector, and what you thought was key to operationalizing this initiative. Thank you. The important role of Ministry of Planning in making the cross-sectoral collaboration happen is it neutral, non-sectoral and neutral role. Ministry of Planning is not the implementation ministry, but the ministry that take care of the central role and collaboration, coordination works among line ministry of the royal government of Cambodia. ID Pool, how is it relevant to this? It grew out of the need to establish a national cross sectoral poverty education mechanism which could serve multiple social assistance programs. Prior to ID Pool, social assistance landscape in Cambodia was fragmented. Different programs operating across sectors, each implementing its own strategy for identifying and targeting beneficiaries. 
collaboration across it will help to create the mechanism for ID pool, which is Ministry of Planning took initiative to create the program to go out and record poor household for use for all sectors in Cambodia. But we have to set up the procedures for doing that and the setting up involves all relevant ministries, 